Good morning. We've been dealing with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I've been telling you that the position of the traditional church, that the gifts are not for today, clashes with the interpretation uh, uh, in which the Apostle Paul uh, clearly speaks to it in a very deep sense, in a powerful way. And so the apostle that wrote 14 epistles of the New Testament, it's hard to contradict him. And of course, this dialogue and this discussion has been going on for a long time. And of course, ministries are made and broken and died in the view of this subject. I don't know a pastor, a minister, who uh, belittles the work of the Holy Spirit and stays alive. And so we're trying to speak about the gifts. I'm already covered uh, the, voc the, the revelation gifts, which is the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, or distinguishing of spirits. Then I also covered faith, working of miracles, and gifts of healings, which are uh, uh, connected to the miracles of Jesus, is the move of the Spirit of God in terms of healing. Yesterday, I spoke about uh, prophecy, or which is actually prophesying. And then, of course, tongues and interpretation. Yesterday, I began to, 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 to share on the gift of tongues, or glossolalia. And so today, I want to continue with that by, by reading <clears throat> uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 because we have been covering uh, that gift that gift to that way. But I want to begin today with, uh, and of course I covered 14th, and, uh, and uh, ended up uh, uh, with verse 13. So I covered 14th with 13th. Uh, today, I want to go back uh, to 1 Corinthians 12 and deal with, uh, because I'm dealing with, uh, with, the, with the idea of tongues. What is it and how it operates and so on and so forth. And so let me, let me say some open re opening remarks. The idea of relating to God in prayer is directly connected with praying in the Spirit. There are spiritual laws and there is natural law. And when tongues is implemented in your ministry level of prayer, you create uh, a bridge between the Spirit of God in the human spirit. Prayer in tongues activates spiritual laws and moves into a new dimension. Of course, let's take a look at one dimension that it's impossible to see uh, without understanding the power of tongues. And so let me go into... Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse uh, 27, in order to, uh, to look at that, it says, well, let's begin with 22. No, uh, 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 I'm sorry, 20. Now, there are many members, yet, but yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor... Again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Meaning that uh, in the body of Christ, uh, we, we are intertwined and dependent upon each other to be able to do kingdom work. Uh, no, much more those members of the body which seem to be feeble are necessary. So the idea here is that... Uh, uh, all of them, even the weakest one, 
becomes necessary because uh, their weakness helps us to understand strength. It's impossible to understand strength without understanding weakness. And as you begin to work with others and you begin to work with people and begin to disciple people, you have to know where they are in terms of their weakness and their strength. And you're going to find out that a lot of people are strength, have strengths, but, but they're not operating properly because they have weakness in them. And so there's a, a, a need of healing in certain areas before they begin to work on, on, on all eight cylinders. And so all those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. Probably speaks of the, of, the, of the internal community. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Uh, 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 in terms of, uh, of, our, of our weakness and our strength. And then he goes, for our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to the part which lacks. So uh, the weak, in terms of uh, activation, God gives more grace, balance, and strength to be, so, so they can begin to grow. And Paul is dealing with growing within community. The tares uh, 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 are fighting for their place, and of course the wheat growing and developing within community. It's impossible for the Holy Spirit to be operative outside of need. These, these should be, that, that should be, that there should be no skim in the body. That members should have the same care for one another. Whether one member suffers, all members suffer with it. One member is be, be dishonored, all members uh, 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 be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now, you see, this idea of comeliness and togetherness is necessary for the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That is why we tell our, our interns that are with us that unless we know what's in their brain, God will not bless them in what they do because the sharing of the move of the Spirit in their lives, it's only seen you by the Holy Spirit when they become a part of, of each other. And so uh, we have reports that every intern does, and the reports come to the, to the body, and the body becomes a part of the reports. It will become engaged together, and then you become to be blessed. And so in other words, it's impossible that you operate in a community and not connect to the actual need of the community and be blessed. You cannot do whatever you think is right in ministry, and, and, and you won't be able to to activate the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your life because you do not partake of the thriving of the community. You, you seem to be uh, on your own agenda and priorities. And then Paul says this, and God has set some in church, uh, first, apostles, second, prophets, but then Third, teachers. And after teachers, he moves into two areas in which he separates or takes out the evangelist and the pastor and replaces them with the miracles and the gifts of healing. So what is Paul trying to say? These are, are eight uh, moves of the Spirit of God or governmental activity of the Spirit. In other words, Ephesians 4 speaks of the five-fold ministries, the, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. First Corinthians 12 speaks of nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, faith, work of miracles, and gifts of healing, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation. Uh, and of course, if you go to... Uh, if you go to, uh, uh, to the gifts, uh, to the fruits of the Holy Spirit, you, you, you speak about love in, 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 uh, in uh, Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the gifts, op the gifts move, the fruit move, the offices operate, and, the, and of course the gifts 
are, are the actual part, the move of the Holy Spirit creating ministry. So what is it then that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 12, 28? He is now working the, the government order. I talked about natural law and spiritual law. He's talking about eight areas of activity on how the Holy Spirit of God activates in the life of a believer. Uh, these eight rules are necessary to be understood before you begin to understand what tongues is. Because if your idea of tongues is not connected to 1 Corinthians 12, 28, you've created a schism, an idea, a concept that is not biblical. You're just afraid of it, or you damn it, you, you, you curse it. You, you just sin against the Holy Spirit because you have no biblical interpretation on why is it that Paul is so, uh, spent so much time dealing with tongues. So let's take a look. And God has set some in the church. Now, it's not Paul. And God did extraordinary miracles to the hands of Paul. It's not Paul. God did it. And so the same thing on 28, verse 28 says, and God has set some in the church, meaning in the church, God creates a position of respect and honor, which is, uh, uh, which is the apostle. Why he puts the apostle first? Because the missionary, the one that is sent, the God called apostles, sets the tone for the church to send the gospel to the world. And there are ministries that go throughout the world. But now you notice there is an order here. When you go to, first, to Ephesians chapter 4, and he calls some to be, he begins with the bottom, to be teachers, pastors, evangelists, prophets, and apostles. But notice now that he began on, on 1 Corinthians 12 with apostles. And then she goes down to the prophet. And then he moves into the third, but he doesn't mention the name evangelist. He mentions it as uh, uh, he goes to teacher, right? The third teacher. And then he mentions miracles and gifts of healings. Which two that are missing here, the pastor and the evangelist? Why do Paul uh, uh, create it? Look, in Ephesians 4, 11, he put, puts in order. On 1 Corinthians 12, he scrambles. But on Galatians 5, it's the gifts, the fruits are in order. Why then Paul begins to deal with, is that his manner of writing? Is Paul just, you know, talking generally about the whole thing? Not really. He's establishing the laws of spiritual laws on how the kingdom operates in terms of the Holy Spirit. He's setting an order that is very critical to understand. And so first he says, now, God set some in church to be apostles. And then he said, second, he said, prophets. Uh, prophets here uh, is talking about someone who speaks for God in, in, in general terms to the church. And then he goes back to teachers. He leaves two behind. But he replaces them with, with, uh, with miracles and gifts of healings, which is the tool of an evangelist and the tool of the pastor. A pastor without the, the need of ministry, healing ministry, is a defeated pastor. Why? Because a pastor is supposed to bring healing to the congregation through the word, to prayer, to imposition of hands, to anointing of oil. The evangelist is a person that is deeply involved in healing. You know, I've been an evangelist now for 35 to 40 years. And I didn't choose this. I didn't do this. I didn't call this. I didn't make up this. Naturally, my first 10 years was to kicking the devil out of crazy people. The next 10 years was dealing with healing. 
in all kinds of ways as I took people to Brazil and, and literally in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to Brazil uh, in ministry. And, and my gosh, all had to do with healing. I didn't read a book on healing. I didn't uh, have an anointing in healing. It's just the office of an evangelist. It's involved in healing and, and, and of course, uh, in gifts of healings and healings per se. It's just the ministry of healing and salvation and deliverance and, and all that. Uh, it, it, just, it just happened. So I see myself being caught into that by the nature of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit begins to do things. Notice, notice that Paul interferes with these two very clearly. And then he begins to deal with other things. Now, the other things that uh, he deals with is helps. Of course, helps is nothing but prophesying. Helps means is, is to care and, and, and to love and to be uh, uh, a, a leader in church and ministry. For instance, this weekend we had the Wake in the Dawn in, in Washington. And, of course, the people there that did what they did weren't prophets and apostles. And it was just a woman with a vision of the kingdom of God to, uh, 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 to bring people together. And, of course, uh, that event uh, became a powerful event to the life of a woman that exercised helps. Now, if you look again to the next, it says governments. And this speaks about organizational skills, administration. Be able to put things together for the kingdom of God. Be able to organize in a certain way. Notice that Paul is, is now setting in order eight areas of ministry that you will never be put into it unless God has set you there. So if you have any dream, any aspiration of serving God, it, it, you need first to understand uh, what God is calling you for and what God is doing in your life because if your life is a mess and is out of order and unbalanced and you, you, you just go into any hole that comes around you, uh, you'll never hear God. God sets, sets the apostle, sets the prophet, sets the teacher, sets the miracles, sets the gifts of healing, which is the evangelist and the pastor, sets the helps, sets the government. Now, the eighth thing it says, sets diversity of tongues. My goodness gracious, why would Paul bring diversity of tongues as a, the last one, uh, mean, meaning, meaning different languages unknown to the speaker and normally unknown to the hearer uh, 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 that requires interpretation or not? What are then, why does gift of tongues come in in an order that Paul creates? This is why I decided to take two or three days to deal with this subject, because the belittling, the accusation, the downing of a gift of the Holy Spirit without understanding only causes you trouble in a, in a, in a lot of, of trouble spiritual uh, in your life. Why did Paul put diversity of tongues or diversities of tongues in the list of order? So you have the first one, you have, you have uh, uh, the apostle, then you have the prophet, then you have the teacher, then you have the two gifts that he replaced and he put in there, uh, 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 miracles and then gifts of healing, and then he puts helps, then he puts administration, that's the seventh. But the eighth, he says, diversity of tongues. The reason why diversity of tongues is put at the bottom because the tongues is the entry level of anything that God does in you. Prayer is the entry level in the kingdom of God. You don't begin with an apostle. You begin with prayer. If you begin with prayer, then God will begin to deal with who you are. <clears throat> if you are going to grow in the spirit and be used by God, it begins when you begin to die to self and have a life of prayer. Now, he speaks about diversity of tongues because Pentecost was when the disciples were, were uh, uh, 
uh, tongues of fire came upon their heads, and they began to speak with other tongues in the public. And in, 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 in people understood what they were saying. In the 120 languages in the world represented, they all understood each other. And, uh, and uh, you say, oh, that just ceased completely. And there's nothing more that happens here. Uh, everything now stops when the canon of Scripture is together. But you see, Paul, uh, as he reads and speaks of the book of Acts, in the first meeting in Caesarea, outside of the Jewish community, in the house of Cornelius, as the gospel began to be preached to the nations, they began to speak in tongues first, and second, uh, uh, they received the Holy Spirit. And so you, you have a problem here a little bigger than the commentary against tongues made by Baptist uh, 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 PhD. You have a problem. There is a schism here. There's a monkey wrench on this. Why is it that we keep on being told by the traditional church that tongues is of the devil? You see, that is why we're dying in church. That is why the Methodist church is, uh, is about to be split and is experiencing hell beyond what they ever imagined. Is because we allow preachers to stand and persecute the little ones that experience the presence of God with tongues or without tongues. And unless we repent before God and kick the butts of those guys out of the church, we're not going to be blessed. And I'm speaking now to those that are considering leaving the Methodist church. I wouldn't leave it. I stay with it. Why? Because I don't run from a fight. Stay with it and begin to minister and, and do it and do it right and stand for. So how, what is the value of this diversity of tongues being at the bottom? First of all, is the entry level into all the gifts, uh, all the calls that are above. If, if, if your life is not a life of prayer, you won't have any inclination to administer in the kingdom of God and create. You won't be able to prophesy worth nothing. You won't be able to deal with people in healing and, and in miracles. And you won't be able to teach. You won't be able to be uh, uh, a, a prophet, a much less to be an apostle of God. So notice that Paul uh, has the, the, the ability to speak from the last, least to the greatest. And, and of course, uh, uh, he, does it, he does it here. The entry level in ministry is prayer. It's a life of prayer. Now, let's take a look at uh, John uh, chapter 7, verse 38, which is a very important verse. From the mouth of the Lord Jesus is John 7, 38. John 7, 38 says this. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, possible to the cross of Calvary, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And you say, well, that has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. But next verse says it does. You see, the devil creates verse 38 in your mind as having to do with the, with the utterance of wisdom and, and dignity and the power of preaching, rivers of living water. But he's not talking about that. Verse 39 says, but this he spoke he of the Holy Spirit. What do you mean? That out of your belly, rivers of living water will begin to flow, uh, which they who believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet being glorified. So the time in which John wrote this was shortly before the crucifixion. When Jesus died on the cross and, and, and was resurrected three days later, he was raised with the glorified body. I'm reading from, the, from, from, from my notes in my Bible, which was one of the signs that all sin had been atoned, now making it possible for the Holy Spirit to come into a new dimension. But notice that the Holy Spirit is categorized here as coming from inside. 
And it happened at Pentecost. And so the thought here is that what happened in Pentecost can't happen today. But it's contrary to anything that I understand. I see as thousands and literally hundreds and millions are coming to Christ and, and led by people that are baptized, filled with the Spirit of God. And so, why tongues? Let's go to, uh, 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 I don't know if, I, uh, 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 if somebody can see this, but we'll go to Proverbs chapter 20 in verse 27. And, uh, and I'll read it to you. The spirit of man is the kindle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Men can have contact with the Lord only by and through his spirit. What do you mean? You mean it's impossible for you to access God in prayer outside of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit searches all the inward parts of the belly. What do you mean? When the Holy Spirit begins to work in you, He begins to separate your flesh from your spirit. He begins to clear the mess that life has done to you in terms of living and begin to put you in a place to where God can use you for His glory instead of you receiving the glory and God getting the can. So the spirit of man is the kindle of the Lord. It builds. The more you pray in the spirit, it begins to build. It begins to, it begins to create. It begins to, you know, I, I, I follow my dad on the streets of Rio de Janeiro as he drove his Harley Davidson motorcycle. My dad, my dad spent all night in prayer. At 73, he must have been 100 years old because he prayed most half of the night. At least he did when I was there. But a mama says he just kept on praying all day long, all night long. My dad never prepared. My dad was a very scholarly. He left hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books. He read a lot. But when he got in the pulpit, my God Almighty, Lord Jesus, he began to preach with so much power that people run to the altar to receive Christ. He prayed in the Spirit. And the Spirit searched all the inward parts of his belly and began to minister and began to care for his spirit. And so when he opened his mouth, Holy Spirit came out. So what are, are the, the reason? What is it uh, why uh, we need the Holy Spirit? And I'm about, I'm about running out of time. So let me uh, say four things. First of all, tongues are for personal Edification. One, tongues are for interpretation. Two, tongues are for deep, deep intercession and groanings. And four, tongues are for a sign to the unbelievers, which we'll deal with tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow at, at 9 o'clock. Or, or Monday, 9 o'clock. Yeah, tomorrow, Frank will come. I'll see you Monday at 9 o'clock a.m. Bye-bye.